is um, where we stopped. Are there any questions from last time? Yes. Yes. So, what we have here is a little simulation of an agent processing binary inputs. So the foundation of everything else are the green dots here. Our little agent receives 320 inputs, and each of them is either 0 or 1. That's what you see plotted here. And the way we present these inputs to the agent is by sampling them from a probability distribution that is indicated in the black line here. You can see my mouse, yeah. So we start out with 100 inputs that are sampled from a Bernoulli distribution with parameter 0.5. So it's equally likely to be a 1 or to be a zero. Then we change the parameter of the Bernoulli distribution from which we draw the inputs to 0.8 for about 20 trials. Then the parameter drops to 0.2, rises to 0.8 again, and so on for a few times until at the end there's another 100 inputs drawn from uh, a distribution with parameter 0.5, where 0 and 1 are equally likely. And you can see that, of course, when 1 is drawn from a distribution that makes 1 more likely, you get more 1s, right? So up here, there are many more 1s than the, t uh, the few exceptions where you get a 0. And conversely, if the parameter is low, you get many more zeros than 1s, and so on. Now, what you see here is what the agent learns. This is the red line. So the red line is the agent's prediction about what will come in the form of the probability of getting a 1 as an outcome. So if we take this point here as an example, here the agent actually correctly thinks that um, an outcome of 0.2 um, of 1 is 0.8 probable. And here, the agent believes, accurately believes, that an outcome of 0.2 is, uh, of 0 is 0.2 probable, and so on. So what you see in red is basically the learning curve. Yes. Yes. This is all simulation. There are no right parameters. There, there are just parameters that um, well. lead to different effects. Yes, exactly. And here, um, the effect I want to show is that um, the same inputs at the start lead to very different learning at the end when the learning rate has increased because of an intervening period of volatility. And so you're adjusting manually the two parameters both the red to the Yes, basically, yes. But during the simulation, these parameters are constant. Yeah. So the parameters don't change. The agent learns. So I don't fiddle with theta, omega, and kappa. These parameters are constant. Only, the only thing that changes is the agent's beliefs about the states. So the agent has beliefs about x2, captured by mu2 and pi2, and it has beliefs about x3, captured by mu3 and pi3. And these beliefs change, and because these beliefs change, the learning rate changes. And how do you choose these parameters? So at the beginning of the experiment, you're At the beginning um, of the simulation, I choose a theta, an omega, and a kappa. 
so so that I can show you this nice graph and illustrate this effect of um, yeah. When we do experiments, we estimate these parameters. After we get the data. So the, the, the framework in which we work is called observing the observer. So the um, agent, in that case a human subject, observes experimental input. And forms beliefs based on that. And we observe the observer's behavior. And on the basis of that, we in turn infer what is going on inside our subject. So there are two levels of inference. A subject infers on the state of the world generating its ex experimental inputs. And we infer on the state of the subject mind. The middle one is captures the mean of the probability distribution on the state x2. And in x2, the model assumes a Gaussian random walk. And in order for that to work, x2 has to be continuous. So there is a sigmoid, a logistic sigmoid transformation from here to here. So if you pass the red line here through the logistic sigmoid, what you get is the red line down here. But this line is now confined to the unit interval, the interval between 0 and 1. Whereas this line can go to either minus infinity or plus infinity. Yes? Yes, so at this point, the random walk we assume does not have any drift. But if you bear with me for a little while, perhaps still today, we um, will introduce parameters that contain drift, even variable drift. Where do we have that? It's a bit constant drift, like this, here. So in the one, um, would it be interesting to have um, a kind of drift? Perhaps. I wanted to keep the um, example simple, but we do often, in the experiments we run, um, check whether our subjects believe in a kind of drift. So, because as I said, we're trying to find out what's going on in their mind. Now, does their behavior show us any kind of belief in drift? So we would pick that up in our parameter estimate. So concretely, we would have an additional parameter row, or at least one additional parameter row, indicating a drift in the random walk here. And then we could estimate all of these parameters based on a subject's behavior. And if rho is essentially zero, that would indicate this subject doesn't see any drift in um, the input generating process. However, if rho is positive, then this subject would be seeing a drift going up. If rho was negative, then uh, the subject would be seeing a drift going down. So one way you can interpret this drift is that if, for instance, here 0 and 1 are neutral, and in the one experimental example I gave you, it was just associations between high tones and faces and low tones of houses. So that's basically neutral. But imagine a situation where the outcome 1 indicates a reward, and the outcome 0 indicates no reward or even a punishment. Then somebody with what we call an optimism bias, somebody who, who tends to believe that outcomes will be better than they usually are, would 
exhibit a certain drift, a certain row towards the top. So they would always be slightly over uh, optimistic in their expectation. Of course, if you always get punished, even if you're over optimistic, even if you have a drift that pulls you up, reality can still drag you down. So the curve can still come down despite a drift upwards. So in experiments where we looked at optimism bias, we used exactly these drift parameters to, to look at the level of optimism bias that people have. Further questions at this point? I, I will run you through the graph. Um, otherwise, the other elements of the graph. OK, so we have this level, and when we apply a sigmoid transformation, we get this. So there's no more information contained in this red line than in this red line. But here, this is different. This is the volatility level. This is the level that determines how quickly um, this level here evolves. And you can see that when this level rises here, you see this line wiggling around much more. And that's exactly what we induce by this period of volatility in the middle. So the agent there, our simulated little agent here, learns that the environment is likely to change a lot. And so it adjusts its volatility belief upwards, and this leads to an increase in the learning rate. Now, of course, once we're back in this regime, this is somehow inappropriate, but it's also very difficult for the agent to learn that this is actually a constant probability, because imagine um, if you have an equal probability of getting a 1 or a 0, then it all just looks very erratic. So if we continue this for a very long time, you, you, would, um, you would see the volatility estimate coming down again, but it takes a long while because, um, yeah, it's a, it's a confusing environment where you basically there's nothing to learn. It's just random outcomes, random zeros and ones. Whereas these environments here, where you have um, an 80% probability of getting a one, um, sort of that's um, an easy uh, environment, an environment characterized by much lower entropy than um, the environment you have here and at the start. Um, is there any way to make a problem with the kind of state of uh, this, uh, this Well, um, this, this is, um, this is no, this is a simulation, so, uh, purely simulation. I mean, if there is a time scale, it might be it is induced in the model, right? Um, it is implied in uh, the value of theta and the value of omega. So um, the value of omega gives you basically, we call this the evolution rate at this level, and theta gives you the evolution rate at this level. Um, well, it is just, you know, we have this thing at the third level. And um, theta is the variance here. So that's basically the meaning of theta. And so... I think sort of what you're getting at is a kind of exponential decay, am I right? And what's the time scale of that decay? You would need, yeah. You, you can have that, but you have to modify the model a bit. Um, again, we'll come back here. So if you want an X3, that sort of can move away from an equilibrium value and then decay back to that equilibrium value. You're going to have to modify your um, uh, process a little. This here is a Gaussian random walk. But then you can also use an AR1 process, and this stands for autoregressive first order. And then you have X3... depending on x3, q3, 
k minus 1 uh, plus, I think, yes, plus 5 times, so it's going to be this with the, at the third level, phi 3 m3 minus x3 k minus 1. And then theta. So this means it, the equilibrium value is is um, m3. It'll go back to m3. And the rate at which it goes back to m3 depends on the parameter phi 3. So imagine um, x3 is greater than m3 then this here will be negative. So it'll be pulled down. And conversely, if M3 is greater than X3, then um, it'll be pulled up. Yes? Yes. So um, it, it sort of depends on which parameter regime you're in. You, you get, I haven't systematically explored this, but intuitively, you get a phase transition. So in one, on one side, in one phase, you, you get this relaxation. It learns that this is actually a constant probability. But if you're on the other side of the phase transition, then the agent just, you know, looks totally confused, left, right, left, right, zero, one, zero, one, gets more and more confused. At some point, this trajectory explodes. Okay, yes, that is a very good question. Yes, yes. Let us have another look at the update equations. Here. So it's a bit complicated, but in the end, it's straightforward. So let's look at this. This governs the update um, at the um, third level. So. Let's look at mu3, what happens here. Let me use the mouse. So basically, we have our old, uh, our old mu3, or the prediction on mu3. If there is no drift, then the prediction on mu3 is simply the posterior from the previous trial. However, if we introduce this parameter rho I spoke about, then the prediction will be somewhat different from the posterior because the model assumes that this quantity is drifting. That's why I write mu hat 3k. So i is going to be 3 here. And so this is our prediction. And now relative to our prediction, we get an update that is a precision-weighted prediction. So this is a quantity... Um, v2, because i is 3, and this is defined down here. And this is the precision weight. This is, this is the precision of the prediction on to the second level. That's pi hat 2. This is the posterior precision at the third level, so this quantity here. And this is the interesting bit. This is the prediction error. And it's the prediction error on the volatility. So, you have the mu2 update here. So, this is your prediction on mu2. So, here, delta i minus 1. So, this is delta 2. So, delta 2, mu i, yeah, mu 2k minus mu hat 2. So, mu hat 2 is the predicted mu2, and mu2 is the posterior mu2. Um, it's, we, we have to be careful um, in what we call the prion. So um, 
yes, in the trial by trial setting, it is the prior, yes. So, but not with respect to the whole time series or trajectory. So, we, because we also have initial values and priors on these initial values when we estimate, just, just, to, just to mention the point. But for our update, yes, this is where we start. This is basically our prior mean. Exactly. So if I switch back to the other, so this is slide 42. So in this case, because we have no drift, it's simply the posterior from the previous trial. That a mu2 hat at time k is simply mu2 k minus 1. It's the posterior from the previous trial. And we update that based, or we, we update the mu3 based on the update in the mu2. It's because the mu2 update gives us our um, prediction error that drives the update in mu3. So if this is large, then this is more likely to be positive. And then the update on mu3 will be an increase. If this is very small, then it's more likely that this will be negative, and then the uh, mu3 will uh, decrease, yes. That's how the two levels, the updates between the two levels are linked. And then you also have a link in the update to the precision, because the same quantity, this same prediction error here, which is a volatility prediction error, uh, a prediction error about how the time series is changing, is it changing more or less than I believed? This prediction error also enters the update for the precision. So at each level, we have a precision update and we have a mean update, and this gives us our posterior Gaussian. Exactly. For, for yes, but the model we chose is itself a, a kind of HDF model. Yes. No. So these are the generic HDF volatility prediction updates. Um, so you, you can build all kinds of models. Again, I will give you a sneak preview on the kinds of stuff we can do. So you can build a model like this, um, where we've got the very different quantities here. So these are two different quantities giving you one outcome. So we will see this is the mean of a distribution you're inferring. This is the variance of a distribution you're inferring. And that um, allows you to make an outcome prediction. And you update your belief on the mean and on, on the variance of the generating distribution separately. And they both have their volatility. So you have two HDF hierarchies going up here. You can do other kinds of stuff like this here, where you have only this quantity generating the output and this quantity pushing this quantity around. For instance, taking their sum, or you, you can take basically any kind of relationship between them. Uh, but this is just the simplest possible example where it's just the sum of them. So if Z1 is positive, it's pushing X1 into a positive direction and otherwise it's pushing it down. And then x1 and uh, z1 both have their volatility hierarchies on top of them, and so on. So you can assemble these models 
modularly. You can, in all of these cases, um, you can use the exact same framework we saw um, of the mean field approximation and um, this kind of Laplace approximation that we did where we expanded around uh, the, expe uh, the expectation value to second order. You can use this exact same thing with the um, variational energy and the update equations that you can derive from it for each of these nodes. And then for each node, you have an update um, for the mean and for the precision. The circles are constants, and the diamonds here are um, also time series, but non-Markovian time series, so time series that don't depend on their own previous state whereas these hexagons depend on their own previous state. But we'll get to that, also to this notation. Okay. So this is basically it about this graph. Any more questions about this one? Good. So, oh, yes, sure. What is the difference? The difference between x and mu is, is fundamental in the sense that one belongs to the generative process and the other belongs to the inferential process, sometimes also called the recognition process. So the inferential process is the process we are um, imputing to the environment. We're basically saying, um, this is the way the environment works. This is the way X3 is generated. So this is how the agent sees um, believes the environment to be. So, sorry. The x's are, the, are part of the thetas here. They're outside. This is how we think the world works, our model of the world. Now, as we receive input, you, we invert that model. So now, this is the forward, mo uh, the forward process. And this is the in solving the inverse problem here. So we invert the model that we believe produces u from theta. And the result of that inversion is lambda, which comprises the sufficient statistics of our beliefs about the environment. So the mu's and the pi's in our concrete case. So mu is here, mu is part of lambda, and x is part of theta. Yes? No, sorry. Parameters do not get updated. The, the beliefs about the states get updated, yeah. So you can call these the representations. So the technical name for lambda is the representations. They get updated, yes. Yes, so if you look at the equations, then um, you get an interesting situation where sometimes you have, depending on the structure, you, you, you've seen that there are many different structures of models you can build. And with every model you build, you have um, a certain dependency among the updates. So some updates cannot take place before others. So it's just that because the quantities needed in these updates first have to be calculated by uh, a lower level update. So um, 
yes, um, you have to do these updates in a certain order. And now um, I'll give you another sneak peek at something I'm really excited about. This is not published yet. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I think Matteo may have gone to get it, but otherwise I'll run and get it from Erica. Students have said that they need the the sheet to. Yeah, I feel. I, like I said, I'm going to be working with them. Okay, so he hasn't. Okay, so um, was there, and I think come back. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, the sheet is on its way. So, since you asked about the order of the updates, these are EEG data, and the great advantage of EEG data is that they have a, an extremely high time resolution. So, these are milliseconds here, and you can see how these updates take place in the um, order that they have in the, um, in the HDF hierarchy. So here are three quantities that basically don't depend on each other. So the updates here could theoretically take place in any order. But then as you go higher in the hierarchy, you, um, you depend on the updates that you make first here. And what you see is that the signatures of these updates, so the time points when the magnitude of these quantities here modulates the EEG signal, prediction error, cumulate prediction error, advice prediction error. It's a, just a very, a quick preview, I will show you the experiment underlying this. So there, we have three different prediction errors here. We have a Q-related prediction error, we have an advice prediction error, we have an outcome prediction error, we have a precision of the belief about the accuracy of the advice. That's what advice precision means. We have a volatility prediction error, that's the um, prediction error about the volatility of the um, precision of the belief about the advice's accuracy. And then we have the precision of that volatility. So the higher up you get in the level of the HDF, the later you see the signature from the brain. So um, this is evidence that the brain too processes these updates in order. So first of all, it processes them, which is um, uh, already very gratifying for me to see. Um, but then it also processes them in the order that you would expect from the update equation. That's from MRI. So we did the same experiment with EEG and with MRI. Because in the EEG, as I said, we have, we have the high time resolution. And in the MRI, so M MRI is a magnetic resonance imaging. It's, it's um, you know, usually in medical diagnostics, you do this um, in a structural way. So, so if you've twisted your knee and you get an MRI from your knee, then um, it takes several minutes to take a 3D picture of your knee. And then, um, your doctor um, just looks at this sort of static picture of your knee and then sees what's broken or what's still there. And we do what is called functional MRI, where we take a picture of the brain 
in about two seconds. And then every two seconds, we take a new one, and we look at the um, changing oxygenation levels of the blood in the brain. And the thing is this, it's a brain region is using lots of oxygen, is very active, then it asks for more oxygen, and this effect tends to overshoot. So perhaps counterintuitively, counterintuitively the most active regions have the most oxygenated blood. So, and because the um, magnetic resonance um, properties of these, uh, you know, the, the nuclear resonance that you get in oxygenated blood differs from that that you get in deoxygenated blood, we can tell which brain regions are highly oxygenated and which ones aren't. But the time resolution is only about at this two second level. So much lower than we have in the EEG. However, the spatial resolution goes down to cubes of about um, two millimeters. So um, those are so-called voxels in analogy to pixels you have in 2D images. In, in a 3D image, you have a voxel. So the voxel size is about two millimeters cubed. And um, so the, I, I think you were referring to, 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 to what's here. Yes, you see lots of, um, yeah, these regions that we color coded. These are the regions where we get significant activity based on our MRI me measurement. Good. Next question. Yes. So um, that's about on the order of 500 milliseconds until you get to the top level. For, for a whole um, new input to be um, process, yes, yeah, which fits about with, um, yeah, with, with the experience you have, um, you know, when, you, when you're in traffic and you suddenly have to brake, um, sort of, um, that's about how much it takes for you to realize that I need to brake now. Further questions? Okay, has the sheet arrived? No, okay. So apparently Matteo has it, but Matteo has walked out. So um, we're going to have to wait for Matteo to uh, return before we get the sheet. Um, anyway, we're going to do a break at some point, and then um, so when are we? We're scheduled to go on until four fifteen, right? Okay, so. Let's um, have a break now of about 10 minutes and then another three quarters of an hour. Come. And I'll go in search of the, um, of the sheet. The exam you will have on um, Thursday. Um, the exam will be a multiple choice affair for the most part of it. So I will just ask questions that you should be able to answer by looking at the slides. So the second batch of slides should now be available to you um, for download. I created a link uh, to them. So if you look at the slides, you should be able to answer these questions. And then at the end of the exam, uh, with, with um, you know, slightly more um, points given, I will ask for a few calculations. Um, most or perhaps all of them um, will also be not too difficult to derive from the slides. No. 
you're going to be alone. It's, it's going to be you and your pen. It's going to be you and your pen. So that's basically the deal. So um, I actually don't know um, in what time frame you will need to know the results. Um, but uh, in a week. Oh, you don't need them. OK, OK. Well, I don't need to make an exam. So um, <laughs> no, probably I. Um, I would be in trouble if I didn't. Uh, so I've made the exam. The exam is, um, yeah, it exists. So, um, yeah, you, we will just meet on Thursday and uh, you will sit the exam. And then, uh, yeah, it should be, by looking at the slides, you should be able to answer the questions. So that's it. So, um, yes? Yes. Um, so, I was just going to ask we had this little discussion with the tutors um, a few days ago, and they um, said they would like to have some material for a tutorial. When would that tutorial be? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. So, that's, that would be sort of a uh, sort of short notice. Um, so, one thing I can recommend you guys is um, I can send a paper to the tutors and also to Erica so she can send it to you and in the appendix to this paper let me just demonstrate the paper here uh, ta -ta. so this is a technical paper on the HGF with my colleagues. This is called um, Uncertainty in Perception and the Hierarchical Gaussian Filter. Let me give you a peek here. I have to system preferences screen displays here and mirror screens, arrangement, mirror displays. Okay. This paper here is about technical details in the HGF. You will recognize this figure here. And um, here are all the update equations and so on and some uh, discussions about fitting and simulating and so on. And then in the appendix, um, coupling between levels, we've been through that. Variational inversion, it's this. And then the actual calculation of the variational energy. So in the concrete case of the HGF, Here we have the generic variational energy at a generic level. Here we have the result of the quadratic expansion and how to find the updates for the mu's and the pi's. And then here, as an exercise, I recommend you in the tutorial, if that's all right with you, the tutors, um, go through the calculation of the variational energy here so you understand the details of where the update equations of the HGF come from. So in the end, we have these um, variational energies, and we have the variational energies for categorical outcomes also, which I just showed you the results of. And then here, we get the results in the three-level HGF. This is the variational energy at the first level, variational energy at the second level, variational energy at the third level. Then you can calculate the update equations from this. So especially appendices, 
appendices B, C, and D would be, I think, very instructive for a tutorial. It's sort of most of it is already given to you. Um, you just have to sort of fill in the blanks between the different steps. But being physicists, I trust you will be able to do it. So that's my idea for a tutorial. Um, and basically for the exam, um, yeah, look at the slides again. You will be able to answer the uh, questions from looking at the slides. And there will be a few calculations. So maybe two-thirds of the points will come from multiple choice questions, and a third of the points will come from uh, calculations. And um, yeah, perhaps some somewhat more weight for the calculations also. But between one half and two thirds of the points will be from multiple choice questions. Any questions on that? Yes. Sample exercises for the calculations. So um, they will be along the lines of. Um, what you saw during, uh, I'll have to see whether it's the, if this was in the first batch of slides, so let's go here. Along the lines of these things here. So there are a few steps in between stuff like this. Relations like these. Stuff like this. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you which ones exactly it's going to be, but um, yeah. Or perhaps I'll ask you to Show me why energy corresponds to negative log joint when we map physics, statistical mechanics onto information theory, something like that maybe. But it's basically, it, it'll be nothing beyond basic algebra calculus. So it'll be basic calculus, basic algebra. And of course, background knowledge. But you can get the background knowledge from looking at the slide. Further questions? Okay, in that case, yes, is there a negative? No. So um, the, the rules for the multiple choice questions will be that more than one possible answer can be correct. And you will only get the points if you tick all the correct answers and none of the incorrect answers. Okay. 
Okay, so let's continue a little here. So what we had here were three parameters that we set, and these three parameters design, defined the whole way this agent here learned. Now we're going to fiddle around with these parameters and see what effects we get. So theta was 0 0.5, omega was minus 2.2, and kappa was 1.4. And now we're going to play around with theta. So conveniently, theta is already on the blackboard here. And so it's the variance at the third level. And you can see that um, if we reduce theta, then that flattens the trajectory at the third level. Not very surprising. But there you can see how by changing um, parameter values, you get different effects. And now, what this also does, it destroys this effect of the increasing learning rate after the period of volatility here. You can see how the trajectory here during the first 100 inputs looks almost exactly like the one um, here in the later, in the last 100 exact same inputs because the learning rate in this example doesn't decrease. And that is due to the flat volatility trajectory here. So just, and we and got this actually very different pattern of learning simply by reducing theta from 0.5 to 0.05. Yep. So now, next parameter we're going to play around with is omega. So theta is back up at 0.5, and with um, respect to the reference there, only omega is changed. But omega is the... Um, sort of evolution rate at the second level. And you can see how much flatter the second level is now that omega is lower. And how much less learning even at the start. So if you compare the learning here at the start with omega minus four to uh, the one with omega, what was it? I don't know, omega higher. Then even at the start, you have much less learning. And here you have much less learning and here it's even more extreme, the difference. And because not much is going on at the second level, at the third level, nothing much is going on either, even though theta is now the same as at the start. The third thing we can um, play around with is kappa. And kappa is the coupling between these two levels because we have, as a reminder, X2, K is distributed as a Gaussian around X2, K minus 1 with a variance of the exponential of kappa X3, K plus omega. So kappa couples X2 and X3. And if we reduce kappa now from 1.4 to 0.2, the lowest level is not directly affected. So we have the same amount of learning here at the beginning as here in the reference trajectory. But because the volatility increase here isn't passed to the third level, as much as it is here for kappa equals 1.4, we have this repeated tendency of the volatility to go down. So when the environment stabilizes, the entropy is reduced, the probability is at 0.8, you can see the volatility estimate coming down and then going up again as the contingency changes. So everything is happening quite appropriately here, but you don't see the same kind of increase in the volatility estimate as in the reference trajectory because the coupling between these two levels is now much weaker at 0.2 as opposed to 1.4.
then what happens to the um, precision of the inference? So at each level, we um, infer mu2 and pi2. And if we plot the pi2 update, so what we actually plot here is the square root of sigma. So the square root of 1 over pi. This is what square root of the inverse precision. That's what we're plotting here. And here you can see what goes on at the second level. We have the reference scenario at the top. Then if we reduce theta, the uncertainty about mu3 also decreases. If we reduce omega, then not much is learned at the second level. And because not much is learned there, we're also quite uncertain about what is going on at the third level. So you can see this uncertainty about the third level increasing, both with respect to the reduced theta scenario as uh, well as with uh, respect to the reference scenario. And if we have reduced kappa, then the information flow between the second and the third level is impaired. And this leads to lots of uncertainty at the third level because the information is just not getting through from the second level. So these are the effects that we get. Um, and you can see sort of the, the richness of the um, different processes that we get from playing around with these um, three um, parameters. Okay, here the decision model. I think we saw that before. Thank you. So this is, again, this map allowing from a certain imprecision for a certain noise in the mapping between beliefs and choices. This is what the subject chooses as its prediction in this simple example we had. So after a high tone, does the subject predict a face or does the subject predict a house? And this decision model has a noise parameter zeta here. And this zeta can be very high, indicating a basically a step function. So uh, your, your sigmoid converges to a step function as zeta goes to infinity. And this means this is an agent who always wants to be right. So if this agent's estimate of the um, probability of getting an outcome of 1 is greater than 0.5, it always bets on an outcome of 0.5. And as soon as the estimate falls below 0.5, it always predicts zero. And in between, or if we lower zeta, we get to curves that allow for more exploratory behavior on the part of the agent, so that we can also model people who sometimes act um, in a way uh, that doesn't give them the highest possibility of being right, perhaps because they want to be exploratory, perhaps because they're not concentrating um, fully um, for whatever reason. This kind of decision noise parameter here is like a safety valve for the modeler. So we always want to have a bit of observation noise because that relieves the pressure on us to get every prediction right. Because this decision model is basically the observation model for us, the experimenter. So we infer the subject's beliefs. And then the, belief, the subject makes a decision. So why is the subject's decision? And we have to allow for some noise in that. Because our model won't be perfect. And the agent won't be, even on the basis of the agent's own model, the agent won't be entirely perfect. We have to allow for that by um, having some decision noise there 
that we can explain away unexpected decisions with. Yes? So, yes. So the sigmoid of mu2 is here. So mu2 is um, on the real line. It's in R. If you pass it through a sigmoid, then it's mapped onto the unit interval from 0 to 1. And basically, your sigmoid of mu2 is your prediction about x1. The explicit? Yes, yes, yes. So there is no direct, um, yeah, you can, it's just one function after another. So the unit um, square sigmoid here is like this. So it's, I'm going to call it, what am I going to call it? Because the other, the logistic sigmoid is called S. How, what are we going to call the unit square sigmoid? Um, USS, unit square sigmoid. USS of X equals x to the zeta divided by x to the zeta plus 1 minus x to the zeta. And basically what we have here is USS after S of mu2. Get that? So it's basically s of mu2 to the zeta divided by s of mu2 to the zeta plus 1 minus s So this is the whole thing. That's what you see on the slide. And S itself, so this is a definition, and S is defined as one um, So you can now go and fill in S, and then you can perhaps find some algebraic simplification. But that's basically um, the probability of the decision being 1 as a function of mu2. That's this. Yes? Yes. So, no. I have the probability of the subject saying, um, predicting an outcome of type 1. I can. I can simulate decisions by the subject this way, yes. But in many cases, I already have the decisions by the subject. And then I compare every actually observed decision to its probability under my model. And I use this to fit the model in the sense of I wiggle around the parameters in order to increase the probability for each decision uh, that was actually observed.
No. This happens um, in an optimization process that is different from the inference process that we've been discussing. So if you look at that paper that the um, tutors are going to discuss with you, that is described in detail there. So um, I can give you the equation numbers. Um, this is the right paper, yes. So I'm talking about the um, decision model calculations that we have. Um, so the abstract discussion of this is in the chapter maximum a posteriori parameter estimation. And this is on page five of the paper, the equations 18 to 21, 22. So what we're doing, I can write this down. What we're doing when we're fitting the model, when we have data from our subject, we fit the model to that data, is we're going to find a quantity psi star. This is the optimal psi. And what is inside psi is all the parameters from both the learning model, the inference model, and the decision model. So in the concrete case that we had here, that would be um, omega, kappa, theta, zeta. So if we take them all together, huh, the set of these parameters is psi. And we want to find the optimal set of these parameters fit to the data, the observation, uh, the observation y we have. And then um, we want to have this, so we take the argument, the maximum psi of the posterior of psi given y, these are the decisions by the subject, and u, those are the inputs we provided. And we can unpack this and say this is the argument of the maximum with respect to psi of the following expression. Sum over k. And k, again, is the trial index or the time index. Log probability of y at time k given lambda k of chi lambda zero and u. And also given zeta, plus the log prior on psi.
Now, let me unpack this for you. These are subjects decisions or observed decisions. The lambdas, lambda k, is the sufficient statistics of the beliefs, mu 2k, pi 2k, mu 3k, pi 3k, in a simple model. Chi, that's the parameters only of the inference model, so a subset of psi. So this is omega kappa theta. This is the initial values of the belief trajectories. So mu two zero, pi two zero, mu three zero, and pi three zero. U is the inputs to the agent, and zeta is zeta. That's just the parameters of the of decision model. And this is the prior on theta, uh, on psi, sorry. And then we have to find an algorithm who does this. There are several candidates. And I'll have some slides on that. So one, I mean, this looks very, very complicated. So one simple way to write this, this is basically just what's here on the blackboard, just radically simplified here into this graph. We have a perceptual model or an inference model. We have a decision model or an observation model. All of these expressions are used um, interchangeably. So this can be a decision model. This can be an observation model. Um, this can be a perceptual model, this can be an inference model. And shaded quantities are observed, they're known, we see them. So these are the trial outcomes, is it a one or is it a zero? And these are the subject's decisions. They are observed, they are known, there is no uncertainty about them. Then hexagons, I'll show you on the next slide the definition of the right? hexagons are states that depend on their own previous state. So yk depends on yk minus 1, and yk plus 1 dep depends on yk. In this th sense, they are Markovian. Then this diamond notation corresponds to the so-called plate notation. If you're familiar with machine learning um, texts, you often see this um, plate notation. So the diamond notation is um, even simpler. And when you have, of course, um, the circles indicate constants. So they have no time index. The diamonds have a time index, but they don't depend on their own previous state. The hexagons also have a time index, and they do depend on their own previous state. So if you see a structure like this, a diamond having an arrow going into a, um, uh, sorry, a hexagon having an arrow going into a diamond, that means that you have states like this, where the diamond states have arrows going from their own previous state to the current state, and the um, uh, the diamond states do not have these arrows. The hexagons do have these arrows. So that's the notation we use here. 
And in this way, we can write models very compactly without getting confused. And, and, and I mean, this is unique. So there cannot be misunderstandings. And yet, it's quite simple. So parameter estimation, I've already been talking about this. It's basically this process of finding Xi star, the optimal Xi, or the Xi that we think was at work, the optimal Xi to explain the behavior by the particular agent we observe. And the question, of course, is now, if we have a concrete subject, are we able to estimate the kappa, the omega, the theta that was at work when that agent produced its decisions? Does it mean anything if one uh, um, agent has a kappa of minus one, or, sorry, a kappa of um, plus one, and the other has a kappa of, I don't know, four? Does that difference mean anything anyway? So, and we systematically explored this. So, what we did was we drew a grid where we buried the parameter kappa and the parameter zeta. And your black bar is always your ground truth. So, for instance, here, let's look at the easiest case where zeta is 24 and kappa is 0.5. Now, this is the ground truth. This bar indicates um, kappa equals 0.5. And now we go and estimate kappa. And of course, doing it once doesn't tell you anything. You have to do it a um, hundred times, or a thousand, I think we did it a thousand times. So we. Um, simulated an agent with a zeta of 24 and a kappa of 0.5. We let that agent make decisions according to our model, according to the models you saw. So what happens is with the particular kappa, omega, and theta this agent has, it'll have a particular kind of uh, belief trajectories as we saw when we bury these parameters and got different trajectories there, then on the basis of these beliefs, applying the decision model will give us simulated decisions. And these decisions in this case were also just binary. So we had a series of, I think in this case it was um, around 400 zeros and ones produced from a particular zeta and a particular kappa. And because, of course, there is decision noise, we have this unit square sigmoid model that gives us a probability for a certain decision. We can do this a thousand times and always get slightly different answers. But that's the nature of a noisy system. And then we take what we get, and we try to estimate the parameters back. So we see whether we get back what we put in. And because all the simulations are slightly different, all the estimates will be slightly different. The parameter estimates. But here you can see, in the case of zeta 24, that means little decision noise. So the Decisions always very accurately reflect the agent's beliefs. In that case, we can very well estimate the ground truth, the true parameter value of kappa. And you can see four little um, uh, box plots here. And these correspond to four algorithms for determining the parameters, for basically doing this part here, determining the argument of the maximum with respect to psi. So the four ways we use to do that is f min search. This is a built-in function 
in MATLAB, which is the, uh, the fancy name for it is the Neldermead simplex algorithm. Then GP is a Gaussian process, a global optimization method. VB is variational Bayes. The, um, yeah, it's, we haven't gone into variational Bayes in um, detail, but it's also a variational optimization method um, where you, as in the mean field approximation, partition your parameter space, and then you update one half of the parameters based on the sufficient statistics of the others, and then you turn around and then you um, iterate until you converge. And the fourth was MCMC, and this is sort of the, the, the gold standard because you can prove that if you sample for an uh, infinite time, you will get a sample distribution equal to your posterior distribution. MCMC stands for Mo Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So all methods work very well when we don't apply any decision noise or very little decision noise. You can see here, it's in all cases um, possible to estimate kappa almost exactly. The kappa we put into the simulation, we also get out again. And this means our estimation methods work. And then here, if we increase the noise, um, three of our methods still work well. However, the um, fmin search function, the, this Neldermead simplex algor algorithm, which is in some, in some sense the most primitive of these methods, um, starts showing some abnormalities here and here. And then if we increase the noise even further, the Neldermead simplex algorithm starts to show clear inadequacies. But also the other methods start um, working less and less well. And if we have very much decision noise, so this is a zeta of 0.5. And if we go back a few slides, um, this is this curve zeta of 0.5, so this goes like this. So basically you don't have any, um, you don't have much discriminatory power here on your mu2. It's very hard from your decisions to, defer, to infer back on the mu2. So in, in generating decisions, you go from this axis to this axis, but then of course when doing inference, you're going from this axis to this axis. And so, um, if you're here or in this region, then you can basically have, be in many places here. So it's hard to infer back on the state of belief of the agent that was in play when the decision was made. And that's what you see here in these very wide um, distributions for um, the possible values of kappa that we infer when we repeat this process a thousand times. So if we do it the other way around, if we look at how the zeta estimates look, um, plotted against uh, kappa, so uh, then we see that in all regions of kappa, we can estimate zeta reasonably well. What you can see is that all the estimates are, or, or the means, no, actually the medians of the estimate samples are somewhat higher than the ground truth. And this is a result of the prior we applied because we wanted to have a so-called shrinkage prior on the decision noise. We wanted to force the model to explain decisions substantively and that means by attributing differences in decision patterns to differences in learning between agents. We didn't want the model to take the simple way out, the easy way out, and just attribute it to noise. And that's why we put a prior on the noise that pulled the noise downwards. So you can see that um, even when the noise is quite high, so for low values of um, log zeta, then 
the estimate is actually close to the truth, but it's slightly biased towards a low value, and that's because we consciously forced the model to make a relatively low noise estimate. Um, further stats on the parameter estimation and comparisons between variational Bayes and MCMC. Um, so in these, in these um, algorithms, we have a posterior interval. And of course, if your posterior interval, where you think your parameter will be with a 95% probability, if that is too wide, then you're underconfident. And if you're uh, it's too narrow, then you're overconfident. And so the interesting thing is to look at the proportion of um, posterior intervals containing the true zeta. And you would want that to be 0.95 for, a, an, for an algorithm with the right amount of confidence. So it's your 95% confidence interval. So you want... Um, the true zeta to be in there 95% of the time. Otherwise, your algorithm is either overconfident or underconfident. So this is overconfident if um, a lower proportion of the true zetas is in the, um, in the interval. For the kappas, um, variational base does a very good job of getting the right level of confidence. It's um, very close to 0.95 always. Um, then, yeah, just looking at the errors in the estimates, of course, as we increase the noise, the errors in the estimates increase. This is for the zetas, and this is for the, um, no, this is for the estimate of log zeta for different levels of noise, and this is for the kappas for different levels of the zeta. Okay, so... Now we know we can actually infer individual belief trajectories. So we, we have mechanisms, we have at least four algorithms that give us tolerably accurate results when inferring on the parameters of actually observed, underlying actually observed behavior. And this is one example of real data. This is a real subject making real decisions that we recorded here. The orange dots are decisions. Here, the subject um, predicts an outcome of type zero. Here, the subject depict, um, predicts an outcome of type one. And where you got an X, this subject missed uh, making the decision within the required time. So this is one learning trajectory that we inferred from actually recorded behavior, and this is another one. So this guy misses a lot of trials. and doesn't learn very much, so you can see his learning trajectory is quite flat. And also his um, volatility trajectory looks very different. And, um, yeah, so you can see vast inter-individual differences. Good, so I think we're five minutes over time. And um, I'm, of course, happy to take one or two final questions. Otherwise, we'll see each other on, uh, is it tomorrow or Wednesday? Wednesday. Good. See you Wednesday.